what we found was that um, participants who were primary caregivers, meaning they had significant responsibilities of taking care of the patient, um, they were much less likely to be able to adhere to our recommendations for diet and physical activity. That was actually one of the first papers published showing that caregivers of cardiac patients are significantly at risk for cardiovascular disease themselves due to suboptimal lifestyle behaviors. You're listening to Parallax from Radcliffe Cardiology in association with makeadent.org. Here is your host, Ankur Kalra, MD. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Parallax. Um, this is episode 120, and um, I'm delighted to have with me uh, on the show for this episode, uh, Dr. Brooke Agarwal. Uh, Dr. Agarwal is an assistant professor of medical sciences at Columbia University Medical Center. And, um, you know, the topic that we've picked for this episode is, is titled Behavioral Science and Educational Strategies to Improve Lifestyle Behaviors. And, you know, I felt that, you know, I mean, I, I shouldn't take the credit all by myself because uh, it was essentially the team at Parallax um, felt that this would be an important topic to discuss, uh, you know, particularly for our listenership and, and our audience, um, the vast majority of whom are cardiovascular professionals, allied healthcare professionals, physicians, nurse practitioners, and and our colleagues in training in different stages of their career. And we know how important it is to uh, influence lifestyle choices for patients with chronic disease conditions, particularly cardiovascular disease, um, because as we know, it, it is a chronic disease condition um, and also some of the risk factors which influence manifest or clinically manifest coronary disease, you know, can be influenced by lifestyle modification and behaviors. So with that introduction, Brooke, thank you so much for doing this for us and welcome to Parallax. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Oh, likewise, you know, the pleasure and the honor is ours as well. So Brooke, I, I would like to get started by asking you, um, I mean, just before we started recording, uh, you brought up uh, how you teach medical students, um, you know, on the importance of behavioral science. Um, so I'm going to ask you, I'm going to start by asking you, you know, f first off, you know, what made you interested, um, even as a career to pursue, uh, behavioral science? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I actually started off in, in undergraduate wanting to be a psychologist um, because I really enjoyed listening to people and hearing about their problems and thought I could help them. Um, but my first job after I graduated college was in a psychology department at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And the principal investigator there was running a study and I was a research assistant. And we were conducting a behavioral intervention as part of the study to try and improve nutrition behaviors among parents of children who suffered with chronic diseases. And that was a really eye-opening experience for me, um, you know, educating the parents in group sessions about nutrition and just how much or how little knowledge they had about what was healthy and what was not. Um, you know, we did get comments about feeding their children things like Cheetos, which if you don't know what that is, they're, you know, a processed food stack that's really consisting of powdered cheese. Um, and they, some of them thought that was healthy because it contained cheese. So, um, you know, I really thought that um, educating on nutrition and exercise and also um, how to actually implement those changes would be crucial and, and maybe, you know, I could make a difference there. Um, and so I ended up going to get a master's degree in Washington, D.C. in exercise science focused on nutrition also. And after graduation, ended up getting a job with the federal government and the National Institutes of Health. And it was right at the time when they were doing uh, the latest, they were compiling the latest U.S. dietary guidelines on nutrition. And so I got to see an inside look at how that policy is created. And all of the amazing scientists that I admire were gathered in the Washington, D.C. area to review the evidence on nutrition and set federal policies. Um, and you know, what I really took away from that was that things that may seem obvious, like limiting sugar and, um, you know, not consuming soda, 
the scientists really could not give definitive recommendations at that time because the evidence was not strong enough. Um, and so I realized that if I wanted to make a difference in policy, I would actually have to go back and get a doctorate um, to to make sure that the science was robust enough that, you know, um, these these experts could actually rely on the evidence to make federal nutrition policy. Um, but along the way, I realized that I was really fascinated by people's behavior and their motivation to do things or not do things. Um, and so I really wanted to get my doctorate in health behavior and health education, which I did at Columbia um, Teachers College and then did a postdoctoral research fellowship in preventive cardiology and just had an amazing mentor, Dr. Lori Mosca, who was director of preventive cardiology at New York Presbyterian Hospital, who really took me under her wing. And she had an MD as well as a PhD in epidemiology. So she taught me all about research methods and um, we actually conducted a behavioral intervention together for family members of cardiac patients. And the results of that and the findings of that trial uh, really shaped and informed how I am able to teach um, behavior change today. Um, wow. I mean, you, you, you know, quite the career trajectory and, you know, thank you for meticulously taking us through your path and uh, it's um, it's pretty interesting. It's fascinating. It's it's awe inspiring. There's a lot of lot to unpack here. So, uh, as as a follow up to our conversation here, uh, you brought up nutrition science, and I, I know we have to talk about behavioral science, which we will. Um, but I think um, nutrition. Let's talk about nu nutrition first. Um, it's garnering a lot of well deserved focus, in my opinion, within the cardiovascular realms and. Um, and societies and conferences, you know, also thanks to the now formed American Society of Preventive Cardiology. And, you know, I think a lot of the health interventions, I shouldn't really say disease interventions, but health or and lifestyle interventions are now taking into consideration sort of the primordial prevention uh, in order to prevent, you know, long-term chronic cardiovascular disease. Well, as a researcher, as an educator, as someone who has seen very closely how federal government um, regulates and forms these policies around nutrition, um, I mean, I can, and you know, I, I'm putting my hat as a clinician investigator here. We did a meta-analysis on vegetarianism or vegetarian diets and cardiovascular mortality. Which which we published, um, I believe now almost three years ago, close to three years ago, and you know, the one aspect in nutrition research which uh, which I find hard to grapple with is just the ambiguity of the cleanliness of the data that you garner. Um, just because by the nature of things, a lot of these studies are observational. Uh, I mean, we're now just starting to see a randomized clinical trial. I mean, we just had one published, I believe, earlier this week with Dr. Pamela Taub out of uh, University of California in San Diego, um, you know, which was basically um, timed intervention in, in diabetics. Um, but I, I, want, I, want, I want to ask you your take as an expert on nutrition research and nutrition science and what you garnered when you were in those halls with the policymakers. Yeah. Well, congratulations on your study, by the way. That that's amazing. Um, so what I what I observed um as far as you know being in the halls at that time, I was actually privy to a lot of emails that went back and forth behind the scenes. And there was definitely some lobbying going on in terms of um, what made it into the U.S. Dietary Guidelines and what did not. Um, so that stood out to me. Um, that's a whole separate conversation. But in terms of the strength of the evidence that experts can rely on to set federal policies, of course, there are many lim limitations um, to observational studies. And, you know, our large population um nutrition epi data is really 
you know, a lot of times what we rely on to to set these recommendations. And of course, there are flaws um, because we can't control for all of the different confounders. Um, and I say this as someone who does observational studies myself. So um, so, of course, you know, I, I understand the limitations of it. And whenever we're trying to work with a very large um, population, for example, in my studies, I have recruited um new cohorts um, to study. And that requires a lot of time and effort and money. Um, so there are definitely limitations to being able to have the data that we need to um, set these federal nutrition policies, um, you know, over the longer term. But I think there is value in, you know, many of these studies and they're really hypothesis generating. So if we see a signal in a large population study, um, you know, it's worth investigating further and then potentially potentially designing a clinical trial around um, around that hypothesis to see if it actually pans out in, in a randomized clinical trial design. Um, so, so, you know, there's merit in that, absolutely, but um, they need to be balanced with the limitations of that type of research. Excellent. So um, moving over to behavioral science now, um, I mean, you, again, this is from the initial answer uh, you brought up motivation, and um, you know, as a behavioral science expert, I wanted to ask you. Um, and this this is pun intended here. What motivates a motivational mindset, or what motivates a motivational behavior? Um, and the reason I ask is that uh, you know, in my own in my own existence as a human being and as a physician, and as a clinician researcher or a physician scientist and all those different hats, um, I have documented, I have actually objectively, because I, I, I journal, so I've objectively documented my peaks and troughs and motivation. And I think, you know, at least for me, I'm just gonna speak on my behalf and then I'm gonna, I, I want to learn more from you. Um, it's, it's, it, it it does not really follow a pattern. It's sort of erratic. It's sporadic. Um, when I get these bursts of motivation and they could be totally independent of what's happening in my life. I mean, I could be in the middle of an emotional crisis and still feel very motivated. I could be smooth sailing in all aspects and yet not feel motivated. Um, you know, the, these spikes are I shouldn't say far and few in between. I think they're fairly, I mean, they're there and then they're not there. And when they're there, I, 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 you know, I'm able to get a lot done, but when they're not there, you know, it's, I sort of have to, um, use discipline as my crutch to sort of show up and get things done. What have you found out in your education and in your research? And is that even something that comes up when you are talking about behavioral science to patients. Yes, absolutely. 100%. Um, I think you really hit the nail on the head there that, um, you know, motivation uh, waxes and wanes throughout throughout our lives. Um, there's a quote that, um, that always resonated with me. It's from a U.S. Surgeon General in the 1980s, C. Everett Koop. And he said, drugs don't work in patients who don't take them. And that's such a glaringly obvious, you know, simple statement. But I think for me, what it um, conveys is that the sentiment that information alone does not change behavior. So that's why, you know, we can be well-educated healthcare professionals about nutrition and exercise and still not be able to implement the behaviors that are needed at certain times. Um, and so, you know, with behavioral science, what it is really is it's an interdisciplinary field and it integrates aspects of behavior, psychological factors, as well as biomedical science um, that's all relevant to health and with the goal of implying that science to prevent or treat disease. Um, and so behavioral science, I want to say, is importantly evidence based. It is a newer field. Um, so you know, one of the the 
the main events that happened to really launch the field was in the 1960s when it was proven that smoking is a cause of lung cancer. And then there was this focus on, you know, well, if smoking is the cause of lung cancer, how can we get people to stop smoking? And so there was a lot of money um, started to pour into research to look specifically at um, changing behaviors. And um, so, you know, one of the the trials that um, that we did in in cardiology d- division at Columbia Medical Center um, was led by my mentor, Dr. Lori Mosca. She was a PI, and I was a fellow at the time. Um, but this specifically looked at motivation, and it was an NIH funded randomized cl- controlled clinical trial called the Family Intervention Trial for Heart Health, or Fit Heart, and it was published in um, Circulation cardiovascular quality outcomes. And in this trial, we enrolled 500 family members of patients on our cardiovascular service line who had recently had a heart attack. And the the hypothesis there was that we used um, the health belief model and the health belief model, this was our framework for the behavioral intervention. The health belief model has two main components. One is perceived susceptibility and perceived severity. So the health belief model says that a person person's behavior is motivated by these two factors, how um, how susceptible you feel you are to a certain condition and how severe it is. So an example would be, um, if I start smoking, I'm susceptible to heart disease, I will get heart disease. And then perceived severity would be, if I get heart disease, I will die. So, so that's what it is. And so the, um, the thinking is that you can potentially predict someone's behavior related to health um, based on those two factors. And so we thought that when a loved one has a heart attack, that's the perfect time to enroll someone in a behavioral intervention because they would naturally be motivated to change their own behavior if they share genes or lifestyle with the index patient. Um, So we enrolled 500 people who either lived with the patient or who, um, you know, took care of them or was, or they were blood related to them. And they were enrolled in a one year um, intervention and they were randomized to either a special intervention or a control intervention. And for the special intervention, what we did was we, I thought this was kind of unique, but we matched them with a non-physician, non-nurse, master's level health educator who spoke both English and Spanish. And, um, they got personalized risk factor screening. So we used cholestec machines, which are basically finger stick machines that have been validated to be as accurate for lipid panels and HbA1c as standard blood draws. And so we were able to um, give participants in special intervention, their results immediately, and then counsel them on their lifestyles. And um, another unique aspect of the, the behavioral intervention is that we... We're, we're stage matching them. So in the tran- trans theoretical model of behavior change, um, it uses, uses stage of change. And there are five stages of change that a person might be at in order to change their behavior. Um, so there's pre-contemplation where they're not thinking about it. There's contemplation where you know it's on their radar, but they're not doing anything. Preparation is when they're actively starting to take steps to change their behavior. Um, action is when they have initiated the behavior, but it's been less than six months. And then maintenance, is when they have, um, they're actively doing the behavior and it's been more than six months. So we would assess each participant's level of readiness to make a change, um, including physical activity, nutrition, stopping smoking if they need it to, in order to prevent cardiovascular disease and then kind of tailor our strategies um, for lifestyle counseling based on their readiness to change. And there was frequent follow-up. So we would be following up with them um, at two weeks, six weeks, three months, six months, nine months and one year. And um, what we found actually was that over the course of this one year intervention, you know, we had to select a primary outcome, which was LDL cholesterol reduction in LDL cholesterol. And then secondary outcomes were um, changes in diet, physical activity, HDL cholesterol, and other cardiovascular risk factors. So for the primary outcome, uh, we actually found that the special intervention did not decrease LDL cholesterol 
um, to a greater extent than the control intervention because they both significantly uh, reduced their LDL cholesterol. It was it was a modest drop, is about five milligrams per deciliter in LDL cholesterol over the course of the year for both groups. However, the special intervention was effective. Um, in increasing physical activity among the participants, as well as improving their diet scores. And they also had um, better HDL cholesterol at the end of the one year. So so we considered it a win, but technically it was known as a negative uh, trial just based on the primary outcome. Um, but, you know, one thing we I wanted to look at after that trial was published was, you know, why did we see those results? And um, so looking at it a little bit more closely, what we found was that, um, you know, when a loved one is hospitalized for cardiovascular disease, it may not actually be a motivational moment because there are a lot of different factors that come into play. Um, one of them in particular for for family members of cardiac patients is their level of caregiving. So what we found was that um, participants who were primary caregivers, meaning they had, you know, significant responsibilities of taking care of the patient, um, they were much less likely to be able to adhere to our recommendations for diet and physical activity. And um, that was actually one of the first papers published showing that caregivers of cardiac patients are significantly um, at risk for cardiovascular disease themselves due to suboptimal lifestyle behaviors. And some of the things that we heard was that, you know, I, as a caregiver, I'm scared to go to the gym because I don't want to leave the patient alone or, you know, I just, um, my sleep is disrupted. That was very common among those caregivers. Um, and then besides caregiving, the second thing that uh, that I found when I looked a little bit deeper in the data was that um, if participants had perceived low social support at baseline, no matter what group they were randomized to, they had 2.7 greater odds of being non-adherent to diet at one year. And so, um, you know, if they started off with low perceived social support, they were much less likely to be able to stick to the diet recommendations that we gave, no matter what group they were randomized to. And, and when we think about social support, it encompasses both emotional social, social support as well as instrumental social support. So emotional social support is things like are things like feeling loved and cared about and instrumental social support are actually logistic help with logistic tasks, you know, chores and things like that. Um, and so social support and caregiving, of course, were very important. But I think it really points to the fact that, um, you know, traditionally, management of chronic disease has been focused specifically on the patient and not really taken into account the larger family unit that may have a very significant impact on um, a person's adherence to lifestyle behaviors. Well, I mean, fascinating study, you know, fascinating findings. Um, when you are, um, um, I mean, I know that you are primarily a researcher now and, you know, you're certainly teaching medical students, but you know, when you were in, in your clinical role, did the findings of the study influence how you would speak to patients and their caregivers after you published these findings? Yes, absolutely. So so those findings um, really informed the way that I would go about speaking to patients um, and and certainly influence the curriculum that um, that I now teach today. So I co-direct a course um, in Columbia's uh, medical school and Institute of Human Nutrition called Essentials of Nutrition Counseling. And it's focused on a mix of different techniques that can be used to help patients adhere to not only nutrition recommendations, but also other, you know, forms of behaviors that we'd like to improve in terms of prevention of cardiovascular disease. And um, so I would say there's kind of a toolbox that we would use and that, um, you know, it's, it's very helpful for healthcare providers to have. Um, and that would consist of um, certain components of health behavior models and theories that could predict um, someone's behavior. Second thing is key components of motivational interviewing. Um, we also use some of the components of cognitive behavioral therapy, and you don't have to be a psychologist to use to use those techniques of cognitive behavioral therapy. There are some key ones that I would recommend, um, as well as 
some of the components of health literacy and keeping that in mind when we're communicating with patients. And then finally, um, really trying to use a patient-centered care model um, and and a lot of empathy when we're collaborating with patients um, as opposed to more of the traditional care model, which is, you know, the healthcare provider is um, kind of the all-knowing person is dispensing information. Um, we want to be more um, in a collaborative relationship with the patient. So, Brooke, let me ask you um, uh, specifically about the course that you've you've designed and th that you teach. Um, and um, well, you know, first off, congratulations! It sounds fascinating. Is that some? So, it's it's nutrition science. I'm assuming that you would. Is this nutrition for or overall well-being or is it nutrition or addressing lifestyle interventions as part of chronic disease management or is it both it's actually yeah it's actually both so we spend the first half of the course teaching all of the different psychodynamics and behavioral change techniques. And then we spend the second half of the course talking about different chronic diseases that they can be applied to and role-playing. Um, role-playing scenarios in which someone is a healthcare provider and someone is a patient with, let's say, liver disease, and they have certain nutrition recommendations that they need to adhere to. And how would we go about um, you know, helping them to improve their adherence? So it's both. Um, so, you know, I'm really interested as someone who actually never really had nutrition training in medical school. I graduated medical school in 2006, and I know a lot has changed in the last however many years, 18 years. Um, and there is a much crucial and deserved emphasis, like I said at the beginning of the show, on nutrition, at least in cardiology it is, I'm sure it is in other areas of chronic disease management as well. Um, is it feasible for you to give us a scenario or run through a simulation just for particularly highlighting the psychodynamics uh, as uh, you know, for our listeners? Cause I think it'll be a fascinating listen to, cause you know, I certainly have not either encountered or been a part of or experienced something to the depth and, and scale of what you're describing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think one of the most common scenarios that we might come across um, and across different chronic diseases is a patient who is overweight or obese and would like to lose weight and um, you know is recommended to lose weight for management of their, their condition. Um, and so in this case, you might have a patient who is resistant to weight loss and is really struggling with needing to um, make those changes and implement them um, into their life. So, um, you know, one of the first things that we would do is talk about how to listen, which, you know, seems very simple, um, but listening is a really important skill and it's not something that necessarily comes naturally to everyone. So we spend a lot of time talking about um, how to listen. And we use the acronym ORS, O-A-R-S, which some people may be familiar with. What that stands for is open-ended questions and um, affirmations, reflections, and then summary. So um, when we are first interacting with a patient, we want to get more information about their situation. And so it's helpful to not ask yes or no questions, but really leave it open. Um, how was your sleep last night, for example, um, and see what they say, because they they may give more information than we were expecting. Um, and then while we're listening, we're affirming. So that could be head nodding, that could be saying yes, um, you know, really showing that you um, are receiving what they're saying. And then reflecting is, you know, taking a moment to reflect back what they spoke about. So um, that could that could say, you know, really, I, I hear you're having a lot of um, difficulty with with managing your three dogs that you have that, you know, that sounds like a lot. I can only imagine, you know, how much work that is. Um, and then summary, um, what we really want to do is summarize all the information that we've heard before going on to the next point. 
Um, so that's what we talk about in terms of listening. And all the while, it's crucial to have a non-judgmental stance. Um, and so that is something that I believe people can feel <laughs> coming from us, whether we have these preconceived preconceived notions about, um, you know, what they're doing. So we really want to, as much as possible, um, refrain from any judgment. Um, and that can show up in the way that we're looking at them, the, our voice, um, tone of voice. Um, so that's something to really, really keep in mind. Um, so that's listening and that's non-judgmental stance. And then from there, what we might do is talk about um, some of the strategies to elicit behavior change. And one of the, the main strategies that we use is motivational interviewing. And what that is, is a method of resolving ambivalence in the patient um, and, and eliciting behavior change really by focusing on the patient's own goals and values, and they may not know what those are. So our job is really to help them identify those goals and values so that we can work on eliciting behavior change. One really important point with motivational interviewing is that it is not persuasion. So I am not trying to sell you on something. I'm not trying to convince you to lose weight or you know eat healthier. Um, I am collaborating with you. So motivational interviewing. Um, one thing that you would do is talk about, you know, what, um, what are some of your goals? Like, let's start there. Um, you know, and they may talk about, um, losing weight, um, but they may say, well, um, you know, I, I've tried a million things and I can't do it. So one of the techniques of, um, of motivational interviewing is to use scales to ask questions. So you could ask the patient, um, you know, how confident are you that you could lose weight on a scale of one to 10? And they may give you a number. Um, let's say they're, they say five. Um, and you would say, how, you know, you chose a five, why not a seven? And then you could start from there to have a conversation about their confidence level, because one of the goals is to really increase their self-efficacy, which is them feeling um, having the confidence to be able to make these changes that we're suggesting. Um, so that's, you know, asking them about their confidence. You can also use scales to really get at how important this is to them. So, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how important is losing weight to you? Um, and they may say it's a three. Um, and then you could turn it around and say, oh, it's a three. Okay. Why, why not a one? And that's kind of the opposite way of asking the same question. So, um, you know, it's it's not lower than a three. Why is that? Um, so the, so those are some of the scales that we use. And then, you know, like I said, when we're um, assessing someone's readiness to change, we do want to evaluate where they are in the stages of change, um, whether they're at pre-contemplation all the way through maintenance. And um one thing that I like to emphasize as part of the, the stages of change is that there could potentially be a sixth stage of change. And, and some researchers have suggested this, um, and that's relapse. And, um, you know, I think it's really important to normalize relapse. That is something that will happen. And when it happens, how can we deal with that? And so how can we um, identify your triggers for relapse? And how can we um, develop stronger coping strategies around those? And it might just be as simple as modifying your environment. So, um, you know, that's something that we talk about as well. Um, but one thing I, I do want to also emphasize is this concept of rolling with resistance. So that's a key feature of motivational interviewing. And like I said before, since motivational interviewing is not persuasion, if someone comes to us and they are really resistant to change, you know, now is not a good time for me. I have way too much going on. I am not going to do this. We don't try to convince them to change, we roll with it. And so, you know, keeping really a neutral stance um, and and um, really just working together with the patient on where they are. Um, another aspect of motivational interviewing is asking permission before sharing information. So we might have a tendency as a healthcare professional to just start listing the recommendations for nutrition or weight loss that, you know, that we are familiar with, especially if we're short on time. But it's really important to, um, to 
you know, ask the patient if they, if I have permission to share with you some information now about, um, about weight loss, is that okay with you before just jumping into it? Um, so those are some of the, the key aspects of motivational interviewing that we use. Um, one other, a, a couple other things that come up, I would say, um, are, um, in, in terms of cognitive behavioral therapy, some of the techniques that we use, um, many people have, um, some, some preconceived notions about weight loss, for example. So something that may come up is, um, a cognitive distortion, um, called all or nothing thinking. And that's, that may show up in the form of, well, I ate a donut this morning, so the whole day is ruined. So I will now, you know, just eat whatever I want the rest of the day. I'm not even going to try. Um, and that is one of a number of cognitive distortions that may come up. Another one and another example is catastrophizing. Um, and so that is, you know, thinking the worst is going to happen. You know, if I don't lose five pounds this week, you know, I'm a failure and, you know, I'm worthless. Um, so really catastrophizing, um, you know, the end, the outcome of the behavior is, is another cognitive distortion. So when these cognitive distortions come, come up, one of the um, ways to handle them is to try and reframe that core belief that someone has because our, our behaviors are really motivated by these core beliefs that we hold and we're we're trying to shift those beliefs. So if someone is is having that all or nothing thinking or the catastrophizing, what we can do is try to prevent or try to present evidence to the contrary. So um so you know it, you can say, you know, well what is the evidence um, against the fact that if you don't lose five pounds this week, you know, you're a failure? Can you think about, you know, the flip side of that? Um, and so in that way, we are addressing these cognitive distortions head on and trying to shift these core beliefs. So that would be an aspect of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, another um, kind of tool in the toolbox that that we talk about is um components of health literacy. And this is really important because, um, you know, we need to think about the language that we're using with, um, depending on the audience. So right now I'm speaking to mostly cardiologists and healthcare professionals. So I'm using, you know, different terms, but um, when we are speaking with patients, for example, in a clinic setting, um, it's really important to just use sixth to eighth grade, grade level um, terminology, both in the way that we're speaking as well as our educational materials. And the reason that we do that is we don't assume anyone's literacy level based on their education or their, you know, what we know about them. Um, we use what's called universal precautions. And that means just really tailoring our communication to sixth to eighth grade uh, level in terms of our education um, in order to make it accessible to everyone. And um, I think this is sometimes really hard for, for healthcare professionals. I, um, it's it's kind of funny, um, you know, you mentioned I, I mostly do research right now as my main focus. And a few years ago, I was collaborating with a very brilliant scientist on a, a grant application for the American Heart Association. And I found it so fascinating because, um, you know, the, the grant looked beautiful and this, you know, scientist was just um, amazing. And um, one of the final steps of the grant application was that they required a non-scientist summary, which is basically a lay abstract. Um, of the the proposal. And they have software in the application that requires you to make it at a 10th grade reading level. And um, my collaborator struggled a lot with this part, which I thought was just funny that that, you know, after all of the, the application, that was the most difficult part for her. But, um, but you know, she was trying to put it, put the lay summary together and it kept getting rejected by the software saying, you know, it was over a 10th grade reading level and took several tries to actually be able to do that. And I was thinking to myself, you know, why is that? Um, one of them is the obvious that um, as, you know, healthcare professionals, we feel comfortable using the jargon that we use in our everyday workplace and other industries do the same. They use the terminology that they're comfortable with in a professional setting. 
But the second thing that I was thinking about is um, well, I wonder if there is a fear that we won't sound as intelligent when we're communicating if we use plain language. Um, and so that's just something I think to consider when we're speaking with patients and, and thinking about incorporating um, health literacy techniques into our into our lifestyle and education and um, improving behavior. Um, yeah, so that's kind of an overview of what we would talk about with someone who may be struggling to lose weight. Yeah, no, this is all so fascinating, Brooke. Thanks for so much for you know empowering us with some of the tools that you described. Um, you know, final few minutes of the podcast here and. I wanted to specifically ask this to you, you know, as someone who, so this is, you know, our, our audiences, you know, clinicians at the, at the trenches, taking care of patients uh, or at the bedside, busy clinicians. And, you know, for someone who is taking care of patients, seeing them in clinic, uh, and as important, we know how important nutrition science is and how important, uh, you know, the bedrock of good nutrition is in terms of both, you know, primordial prevention, primary prevention, secondary prevention, the across the spectrum of entire cardiovascular disease or chronic disease management, nutrition is an important bedrock on which you would, or, you know, you would sort of start deploying other lifestyle interventions, including exercise. And, you know, what the, the tools that you've, you've described eloquently, and, you know, thanks again for sharing them with us. How would you, um, advise busy clinicians to sort of incorporate these into their clinical practice? Yeah, well, the good news is that these techniques are all evidence-based. Um, and in a meta-analysis of motivational interviewing studies, there were um, 72 stu studies identified. And it was shown that even in very brief healthcare encounters of 15 minutes or less, Motivational interviewing was effective in 64% of those studies. So there is really good evidence to show that um, that you can have a significant effect on improving lifestyle behaviors by using some of these techniques, even if you have you know a very short amount of time with a patient. So um, so I think that the most important takeaways to really focus on when you have a short amount of time, um, one would be trying to build rapport with the um, participant because because again, um, social support is very important. And if someone doesn't have that, you might be the source of their social support. Um, so building rapport is extremely important. Um, and then trying to increase their self-efficacy. So what can you do to increase their confidence level in taking action? Um, and then help the patient develop a discrepancy between what they're currently doing, their current behavior, and their goals. So in order to develop that discrepancy, you do have to first identify, help them identify what their goals are. You know, we're not telling them we are working with them um, and then sh and then kind of working to um, show them that there is a discrepancy between their current behavior and those goals. And all the while, again, you know, having a nonjudgmental stance, um, really trying to be empathetic and collaborative in your interaction with the patient to support their health behavior change. And then also focusing on on um, some of these psychosocial implications for the patient and their family. So, um, you know, thinking about their environment, it's really crucial um, to, to take a look at what type of setting they're working with. Um, and some of those things can't be changed, but one of the key techniques of cognitive behavioral therapy is stimulus control. And so if someone really has a difficult time with, let's say, binging on chocolate chip cookies, the recommendation would be to completely remove cookies from their environment. And some might say that's extreme. We should be able to have them in moderation. But stimulus control really takes into um, account that, you know, that's a really, really strong pool. It's a strong trigger. And everyone has their own individual triggers. And so we need to be able to control our environment to, to have some sense of, um, you know, control over our behaviors. Excellent. Well, you know, thank you. This has been very educational for me uh, personally. Thank you for uh, spending time with us on, on Parallax and educating our audience about uh, the importance of, um, you know, behavioral science and and motivational interviewing. That I, that term actually, motivational interviewing, is new for me. So, you know, thank you for introducing me to that term. Any closing remarks, Brooke? Anything you think we uh, should have discussed that we did not discuss? 
No, I mean, I really, I'm happy to hear that motivational interviewing was new for you. Um, I think I would just leave leave you with um, saying that human behavior is very complex. It's, you know, some of our choices are conscious and some of them are unconscious. So, um, you know, it's not just a matter of common sense. Um, it's not just a matter of getting our message across. There are several different factors that, that really can predict human behavior. So um, it's important to kind of take all of that into consideration. But thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, the pleasure again is all ours. And, you know, thanks again for being here with us and uh, for sharing your work. Um, for those of you who've listened to both Dr. Ag Agarwal and I, if you have any feedback for us or if you have any questions for Dr. Agarwal, you can send us an email and we'll for sure forward it to her. Do rate us and review us on various podcast platforms, you know, including Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud and Spotify. Until other Monday, thanks again for tuning in and listening. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast produced by Radcliffe Cardiology in association with makeadent.org. We aim to bring you a new angle of all things cardiology every second week. Review us on your favorite podcast app or send your comments or questions to podcast at radcliffe-group.com. To view the series, head to radcliffecardiology.com forward slash podcasts forward slash parallax. Thanks for listening.